As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. I missed you all last week. I, I played a little hooky. I was leading a doctoral cohort in Cambridge at Westcott House for, for part of the week. And then the, uh, the other part of the next week, uh, I was leading another doctoral cohort in, in Oxford. So we did the Oxbridge kind of event. And uh, frankly, I was really, I, th I had all these plans. I was going to do something fresh and live from, from Oxford or Cambridge, one or the other. And um, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I was weary and well uh, laden. So I'm glad to be back with you. Thank you for your patience and giving me a little um, hiatus of a, a vacation, although it was a fun working vacation for me. I love working with doctoral students and uh, and what better place to to learn than at Cambridge and at Oxford. We're going to go right to the lectionary passage that I want to focus on. This is Matthew 11. It it um it ends the 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 selection actually begins verse 16 to 19 and then it says go to 25 to 30. But I just want to end with with the 28, 29, and 30 verses. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now notice, church, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, now the church says, work, more work, come here and we'll work. You know, Jesus promises something different than the church often promises. Jesus promises us rest, Sabbath, peace, not the... Um, R.I.P. of death, but the R.I.P., rise in power of life. And that's the kind of, of rest uh, that, that he offers. Now, I, I learned something. I may have known this before, but I forgot it. Um, I, I have one of these, uh, yeah, you didn't know this, but you just forgot it, but I'm not sure. But you and I, I, I greet you all as donuts. We are all donut. Now, some of us are bigger donuts than others. But the geometric shape for the human being is called a torus. We are a three-dimensional torus. Think donut. In other words, we have this, this, this flesh, but in the middle of the flesh is a hole. Okay, it, the hole starts here, and you know where it ends. It's called an alimentary canal. So we're just one big donut. Some of us bigger donuts than others, but we are a, geometrically, the human species is called a torus. That's our geometric shape, which is the same shape as a donut, although it's a little lengthier donut and sometimes a wider donut. But we're this three-dimensional um being Taurus with a hole in the middle. And the hole starts here and it ends, it's, you know where, and it's called the alimentary canal. Now, one of the things that they're discovering is that as a species, um, they're calling it a paradigm shift. We are um, more than we think we are. And we're comprised of more than we think we are. We think we have a lot of cells, 
lot of cells in our body, the average weight person has about 37 trillion. Did you get that? Trillion cells. But there are things, as, when a child is born, in the child's gut already are bacteria, fungus. Uh, it gets more from its mother's milk. It gets more bacteria and fungus in the birth process. And we used to think these were like parasites that are living on us and, and um, you know, feeding on us. And you just have to live with them, all these little, little bacteria and fungus and things. And that, that's called, uh, we benefit them and some of them benefit us. That's called symbiosis. A symbiosis is when two people join in a relationship to get something out of it. Uh, each one gets something different out of it. And um, so symbiotics, symbiotic, there's a lot of words that, uh, that go with us, with that. But um, the, the new discovery, and I just, when I came back from Oxford, I started reading all my back issues of, of The Economist. And the first one I picked up was the June... Um, 17th through the 25th, the front cover feature is on India, but it has this three-page section here, what is an organism anyway? And they start talking about a paradigm shift taking place and how we look at the organism of the, the human body. And they're calling it revolutionary, a fundamental paradigm shift, as Thomas Kuhn talks about it. And when you have a paradigm shift, as he uh, mentioned in the structures of scientific revolution, you go back to zeros. So everything starts over and you start thinking new about everything. And they think we're at that point with moving from looking at these parasites, these bacteria and microbes and fungus that are in the human body. And if we have 37 trillion cells to the average human weight, these little microbes and, and bacteria and fungus, they add another 37 trillion. But they're not 37 trillion that are in a symbiotic relationship. They're calling it a holobionic relationship. In other words, we can't live without them. And they're not just, we can't live without them, that's and they can't live without us, that's symbionics. But a holobionic universe means that we're all part of the same organism. That to look at them as separate from us is a fundamental category mistake, that we are all part of the, of the same. Here is, um, here is the um, argument. This suggests to some biologists that the time is ripe for a paradigm shift, a new way for scientists to look at the world. Um, in th th these communal critters that, that share our life together as one organism, they're calling it, we had symbionts, now they're call it, calling them holobionts in a holobionic uh, universe. Now, this is not as much of a paradigm shift. They have three pages on this. Um, what is an organism anyways? Uh, you seldom see this amount. Of, like, a, like a little essay. You seldom see this in the economist. It's not as much of a paradigm shift as they say it is because um, back in the 60s and 70s, this is coming from biology. Back in the 60s and 70s from physics, people like David Bohm, um, Bell, Bell's theorem, um, they were also proposing a holographic universe. In other words, don't think of the universe as separate, but think of it as, as one big hologram and we're all connected in ways in which we don't understand. Now that got a little new agey, so everybody abandoned it, but now we're back to a holodonic universe. So we went from holographic, now it's holodonic. But the point is that you cannot separate anything from anything else. That we are all connected in ways that we never understood. That we were not meant. We were not, we're not born alone. We're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to go it alone. We're not meant to be alone. 
we are all part of a larger whole and that we are connected in ways that are mysterious beyond comprehension. And we're connected to things we don't even know exist. So it's a fundamentally, but the, these connections are fundamentally holodonic. That's the new word. In other words, they're part of this one vast whole that exists together and evolves together and adapts together. And that's what the yoke, the yoke. I think one of the two of the most powerful early symbols for Christians, one was the ichthys, the fish. And the other was this yoke, this Yahweh yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Um, the yoke means, literally, yoke means to join together. And the reason why this is a fundamental, and we don't know what to do with it, we, we think of it because it's such a mixed symbol. We think of it as, in many ways, a symbol of oppression and... and uh, kind of burden. You take a burden and you, you, you're oppressed and having to take on a yoke. But not, that's not... The word religion, the, the, you break it down, religare means to bind together, to connect. And that's what a yoke means, to bind together. So the very essence of religion is a connecting together, a binding together, a joining together. And in fact, yoke and religion basically mean the same thing. And we also need to contextualize this in that Jesus took on the profession of his father, who was a tecton. Now, you can't think carpenter, how many trees you see over there um, in the Middle East. But you've got to think of craftsmen. Uh, so they dealt more in stone than in wood. But the wood that they would have made... As a tecton, certainly one of the things that they would have would have made, um, as well as carts, winnowing forks, plows, but they also would have made yokes. So Jesus knew this imagery very well because he most likely, as a tecton, made yokes with his father. Um, now, um, I, I say the two primary images, early Christianity, yokes, and, and fish. Um, we could do a whole time on this ichthys, this fish symbol. Christ, I call Christianity a fish story, but it's a fish story based on history, not on, on a hyperbole. And it's a fish story where the catch didn't get away. All these are, oh, they got away. But... They were caught, and you and I are caught in the net. But the net is called a yoke, a Yahweh yoke. A Yahweh yoke that is easy to learn, light to bear, and a joy to wear. Because Jesus is our yoke master, our yoke mate. Or as Paul himself puts it, um, our yoke fellow. Um, and this is part of the, I call it the joke of the yoke, is it burden, but it's easy. Um, the, 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 my burden is, is light. Um, it's, so you get this paradox here. Something heavy is light. Something weighty is easy. Um, and that's the, the yoke joke. Burdens are easy and light. Now, the yoke, people didn't wear literal oxen yokes, but there are symbols that went with it and symbolized the yoke. The talit, or the mantle of grace, is a sign that one is enwrapped in the saving and healing grace of, of our Lord, encircled in the covenant yoke to Christ. Um, and I'm going to say more about that in, in just a minute. As I said, yoke can be a negative symbol, which is why we probably don't use it, because we associate it with the slavery and the Egyptians uh, over Israel, over the Hebrew people. 
But yoke can also mean unity and cooperation. Look at the book of Isaiah where God promises to put my yoke upon them and I will teach them to walk in my statutes. And this is where Torah was seen as a yoke. The yoke you put on the yoke of Torah. Yoke can also mean training and discipline. The phrase Jesus used as yoke fellows, the Galatians 6-2 phrase, bear one another's burdens. Now, a yoke fellow is a close companion, a co-worker. And the precise word yoke fellow is used only once in the New Testament in Philippians 4.3 where Paul uses it. But everybody knew when Jesus said here in our passage for today, they knew what he meant when he said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The the easy yoke meant that the burden bearing that we shoulder isn't heavy because Jesus is pulling with us, pulling for us. Now, there are different kinds of yokes. Just, just to mention this, um, I don't want to get allegorical here, but we could find something about each one of these yokes that could preach. There's a neck yoke, pulls extra heavy loads. There's a head yoke. Uh, sometimes it's attached to the horns of the, the oxen. Uh, keeps the oxen in a straight line. Um, yoked oxen are actually a liberated um, oxen. Um, because they then have the the freedom to not just mindlessly wander and trample, uh, but they can plow a true furrow and um, a path that can actually produce uh, uh, fruit and plants. And the idea here is that those who wear the yoke of the Torah are free to live a directed life, an ordered life, a fruitful, um, bearing life before God. There's the wither's yoke placed on the highest point of the shoulder for easiest lifting. There's the shoulder yoke, keeps loads from slipping off an animal's back. And then um, some of you may actually have pieces of clothing with what is called in the in the uh, fashion industry a garment yoke, a piece, piece of harder uh, fabric that's sewn into the garment to give it certain form and, uh, and shape. Um, for the Hebrew people, the Torah was their yoke. Jesus is transferring, transferring that image from the Torah to the cross. So when he says, take up your yoke, it's really, it's the same way of saying, take up your, your cross and follow me and I will lead you. Just follow I'm the leader, you're the follower, just follow my lead. And as one oxen is always the leader of, of the other one. Now, we do have visual images of the yoke that is in um, the, the tradition. Head coverings were a form of yoke. The tallet, the prayer shawl that you put around you when you prayed, and they had the zitzit, the wings, healing in his wings at the, the, at the four edges, that was a form of yoke. You were symbolizing, mantling yourself, cloaking yourself, yoking yourself to, to Jesus, to, to the Torah, or to, to Christ. And the same with the kippah, the, the hat, the little skull cap that, that men wear. That's another uh, form of, of yoke metaphor. Now, what's happened is that we lost a lot of that and we professionalized it. So the stole that clergy, when they get ordained, they get a stole and you put on a stole and that's the symbol of the yoke. Um, robes can also be symbols of, of yoking. Um, and these are all um, raiments of, of holiness and, and covenant commitment. Um, 
I also think that another the veiling in the veils and the in the temple um, scholars debate about how many veils there were. I think there were three, but they're also called curtains um, in the Herodian temple. Um, most argue, don't, I'm, I'm in the minority here, because most argue for one or two. I think there were three, three veils. First of all, there were um, three veils in the, in the tabernacle, ten curtains. So why not the temple? Since, since everything, second, since everything in the temple was highly symbolic, it seems dubious that there are only two veils, since the number two is an incomplete number. It's always waiting for a resolve in the third. And Josephus speaks of veils in the plural, suggesting there were more than one. So there had to be at least two, and two is an incomplete. So, so I think the first veil ushered any Israelite with a sacrifice into the outer court. And that's where the gift was inspected to make sure it's without blemish, without spot. And this was first veil was that of sacrifice and repentance. And so you were veiling yourself um, in repentance. Second veil blocked the entrance to the holy place. You could peek in and gaze at the table. You could peek in and gaze at the golden lampstand, the, the um, almond tree. But only priests could enter. And this was the veil of redemption. And then, of course, was the third veil, everybody's agreed upon, <laughs> okay, which hung before the Holy of Holies, in which the Ark of the Covenant was placed, and God presided and was present in this cube of darkness. And this third veil was a symbol of Israel's covenant relationship and the future revelation of God. When all three holy spaces would be one, and the veil separating the human and the divine would be rent by the one who wore the veil, that is his flesh, veiled in flesh, the Godhead. C, hail the incarnate, D, a T. And the, the bridal veil is also a mantling, a, a yoking, a symbol of uniting things. Uh, together. As I said later, the cloak or the mantle would be gifted to those called to speak in God's name, a prophet, a priest, a seer. Um, and, um, but I, I grew up in a tradition where women wore bonnets. In fact, at camp meeting, my brothers and I would, would, um, would, would talk to one another, how are the bonnet babes this year when we were teenagers? Um, Women wore little bonnets. Um, a lot of them had prayer, had these these uh, shawls on them. That they there's another uh, mantling, a yoking, um, and the, the 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 stole is as I said the equivalent of the tallet used in the priestly function. Although it's lost its sense of healing, um, which it used to have. So. We, in this holodonic universe, are all yoked creatures. You can't, it's not a choice. You have things that are yoked to your body that are now part of your body as one. And the only question is, who are you going to yoke yourself to? Who is your yoke? What is your yoke? And we are being invited here directly by Jesus. Take my yoke upon you. You got all these other yokes that you could choose, but the one that you were made for in this holodonic universe where we're all connected is, is the yoke of Christ, crucified, risen, rising, returning. This is the, the true yoke. And this is what it means to take up the cross, is to allow the, the yoke of Christ to guide and guard your journey, to follow him. 
and that this is not an easy thing. Uh, his The burden is easy, and the journey will be fun, but it's not going to be easy street. But it's only easy because Jesus is sharing it, it with us. You will yoke to someone or something. The yoke is no joke. You will, in this holodonic world, it's the nature of holodonics that you have to yoke to something. So become a yoke fellow. Take Yahweh's yoke. Take up the cross. Take up the yoke of Jesus. Unite with him. Let him be your yoke master and your yoke mate.